Good evening. Good evening. Audience. There's going to be a lot of audience participation tonight, I'm going to warn you now. Um, thank you all for being here. Uh, this is the inaugural event of our presidential speaker series. Um, I'll tell you a little about the series, and then I'll introduce tonight's speaker. So the goal of the speaker series is, um, I think a university should be the intellectual home of a community. Right? So part of that is inviting people to campus so our students, faculty, staff, and community members uh, can come in here from a vi wide range of perspectives. Uh, so over the course of each year, we'll have four to five events um, that invite people to campus. So this year, um, in, in late October, we'll have uh, two of our state senators here, one from each political party, uh, to talk about working across the aisle. Um, and then in the spring, we'll have, in February, we'll have um, a, a talk on Food as Communication in Appalachia. Um, and then we will host um, our artists in residence in March um, for a speaker series. And then we're working on a, a final one uh, towards the end of April um, that we'll announce. Uh, but you can check those out on the, on the President's uh, Speaker Series website. Um, and then starting next year, we'll announce some more. But then we'll, at, we'll start to reach out to the community, too, to see if you have ideas uh, for additional speakers. So thank you for being here tonight. Um, the format of each of these will be um, some remarks by our speaker, a fireside chat with me and the selected speaker or speakers, and then audience questions. So as you're listening to tonight's speaker, think about those questions you might want to ask, those topics you might want to engage. So without any further ado, I'll introduce tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Chris Phillips. Um, I've known Chris for about 10 years. Um, I saw him speak in an event very much like this. Um, and the goal for the speaker series is to get conversation started. And I don't know anybody who's better at getting conversation started than Chris. Right. So he's written several books um, that talk about the Socratic method, that it talk about how to engage each other. Um, and then he's experienced in some of the best ways. He started his career as a teacher. Right. Then he worked for newspapers, upgraded to magazines, and then started writing books. Um, so you'll see, as he talks about his experiences, we talked during the fireside chat, there's been a lot of engagement in his life, right? So he brings engagement to everything he does. Uh, through Socrates cafes, democracy cafes, Shakespeare cafes. We'll talk about all of those tonight. Um, so I'm really excited uh, to invite Chris here, and he'll tell you a little about himself, um, and then I'll get to ask some questions, and then you all will too. So without any further ado, Chris Phillips. How are you all doing? Thank you for coming. Um, I started a group called Socrates Cafe in August of 17th, 1996 in Montclair, New Jersey. Anybody heard of Montclair? Anybody heard of New Jersey? Okay. And I asked for this bench because that's what I did at a little coffee house called Collage 2. I perched myself here, not to be above the fray, but to be in the middle of it. And we, uh, participants of many, many different perspectives, gathered round and we inquired together into timely and timeless questions. Questions that, in a way, helped us further articulate, who am I? Who do I still want to be? Can I, can I be some of the change that I would like to see in the world at large? Did we always articulate it that way? No. But just the mere fact that at a time of great division in the United States, unlike today when we've come together as one, people sh uh, rose to their higher angels and we inquired together in ways that showed that we could discover uncommon ground, uncommon common ground sometimes. It, it exceeded my expectations. I think I started at Socrates Cafe for very selfish reasons, because I was a pretty impatient guy. I was too much like what you would hear on TV and radio, browbeating, one-upmanship, you know, not really listening, because you wanted to get your point. You wanted to get your zinger in there. And Socrates Cafe gave me a chance to step back and to hark back to the lessons that I learned from my Greek grandmother, my yaya, 
uh, who became, <coughs> excuse me, the first teacher Greek language and culture when they finally settled in the Tampa Bay region of Florida. All the lessons that had lain dormant with me suddenly gave me an opportunity to practice the version, very earthy version of the Socratic inquiry that she had taught me starting when I was very, very young. I, I didn't even know that I had retained it so well until America, my beloved democracy, had reached a point where uh, there was so much finger pointing and not enough mirror looking saying, well, what about me? What, what kind of problem am I causing or at least not contributing to solving? And then I thought, well, maybe Socrates Cafe might in some way show us to ourselves that we can be thoughtful, we can make our points well, but still listen to others who see things quite differently than we do. Um, Sometimes we'll fall flat on our faces, but at least we made the heartfelt attempt to, to but, but most of all, to just listen to one another, to share our stories, to say not just what we think, but why we think what we think. And so it was all about tearing down walls. Now, I don't think all walls are bad. Sometimes you've got to build walls, maybe. Uh, we, we've certainly talked a lot about walls in the context of immigration over the last years. Uh, some walls so can, you create them to protect yourself and they end up doing you more harm than you thought. The Greeks of old created a wall that um, was supposed to protect them from the enemy, but then the plague came and they ended up getting contagious virus and it decimated them. So you just never know. It might not serve the purpose that you had originally intended. So my first book, which became an unexpected hit, was Socrates Cafe, based on my now 28 years worth of sojourns around the world. It had been very US-centric for the first years. Never occurred to me that it would resonate with other people, but then maybe it should have, because Socrates claimed to be a citizen of the world, even if and as he stayed uh, put in the Athenian polis, and even as he lost his life. He was convicted on trumped up charges of impiety and corrupting the youth. Uh, Athens oligarchs were, had effectively demonized him and his actions at the moment didn't come out as one might have hoped. What happened with Shoc Socrates, as with so many others uh, I admire so much, is their works transcended their mortal moment. It transcended culture, it transcended epoch. And so it came back and spoke to me uh, in a way that I sort of channeled my grandmother, channeled uh, Socrates as she taught his form of inquiry to me at a time when I felt that I had to do something to help my beloved democracy uh, when I felt it was basically on existential life support. Here we are 28 years later and Many people think the situation's even more dire. Um, I have an 11-year-old and an 18-year-old, so I have to fight the good fight more than ever. I think that we have to have faith in one another, that we can engage with one another even as we deeply disagree. Uh, what's wrong with deeply disagreeing? Nothing patently is wrong with it. Where it becomes problematic is when we deliberately demonize one another, insult one another, and then there's other forces, countervailing forces that come. Uh, disinformation now, misinformation that on social media in ways that weren't there when I was when I started Socrates Cafe. And how do we even know what is misinformation and disinformation and what the bots are? Uh, it takes a. It, it, we can disagree on these things, it, and it's not just about agreeing to disagree. It's about agreeing to try to engage one another, to listen to one another with all our being. Uh, most colleges offer courses on rhetoric, debate, forensics, per persuasion. They're all vital, absolutely vital. But we also need to resuscitate the art and science of careful listening with everything we have. Because I think at our core, we're storytellers. Everybody wants to tell their story, but how many wants to really listen to other people's stories? And so for me, I think we use philosophical inquiry uh, in, as ways that give us a chance to share our stories, but make others serve as, as an impetus 
where others want to listen as well. So Socrates, my, last, my latest book is called Soul of Goodness, and it uh, shares the history of my grandparents' immigration from the tiny volcanic island of Nisuros in the South Aegean of Greece, that to this day, when it's not tourist season, is a population of less than 1,000. And how, you know, they came to the United States. They initially were settled in Hopewell, Virginia. They faced a lot of racism, attacks by the KKK. My father was teased mercilessly for his thick Greek accent. Uh, so he had a lisp from the trauma of that to his dying day. Uh, and, but they also appreciated so much. They came to America just months before Congress passed a law, it was a nativist time, when there was a sort of an anti-immigration tide. They didn't allow any further immigrants from southern Italy and southern Greece, which meant the poor areas. It was, I write about that in my book, Constitution Cafe, initially. But I also write it for personal reasons, because as much as I am good at communicating and having these dialogues with the public, Part of it stemmed from a yearning from the family of my childhood and youth that never communicated well. They, there were moats between us. And I always longed to be able to engage in healthy communication. And it just wasn't happening in my family itself. So I began holding these in my intermediate school, Carver Intermediate School in Newport News, Virginia, at the height of the desegregation era, holding these types of dialogues. I wouldn't have even thought to call it Socrates Cafe back then between 1972 and 1974. But it brought black and white students together. Sometimes one of them uh, didn't like what I did and poured a thing of milk on me. It was really not, it was pretty humiliating. But People rallied around me. They rallied around what I was doing. I just got together last week with somebody I've been friends with since the very first one I held who stood up for me. He's a really big guy. Uh, and he, uh, we got together last week in San Antonio. And he recalled our, our first gathering. And he said, this is, this is what we need. You know? And be, at, after a while, what happens when you engage in real dialogue? You forget about time. You forget about place. Or you zone in and zone out. You know, you're no longer doing this, but it's, um, a tra it's transporting. It transports you. So you forget about walls of certain kinds, you know? And at the same time, I think of my, I carry my grandmother on my shoulder. I carry my late father on the other shoulder, you know? It's supposed to be, it's also a rather tenseless affair, where at Ephesus time, present, past, and future, it almost becomes beside the point for a little while until you emerge from the discourse. So for me, it's magical. You know, it's fun. It can be intense. It can be passionate. But it's thrilling and humbling that I can still get up on a stool and have some people, five people, ten people, you know, how, however many, and we can have at it and leave more thoughtful. Believe it or not, that's my main goal is just to be more thoughtful. If we can become more thoughtful, that that's, can be earth-shaking. Just more thoughtfulness. Well, you made me think about something in a way I had never thought about before. And so those, that's, that's the ultimate goal, is just greater thoughtfulness. And then I leave it up to sort of other complementary initiatives. There's so many civic dialogues, worthy civic engagement initiatives, that once we feel a greater sense of connectedness from this thoughtfulness, we're more willing to engage, more willing to debate. You need to debate. You know, sometimes you win, sometimes you lose. You brush yourself off and you get back in the fray. Yeah, as I write in Constitution Cafe, when uh, Jefferson and the other uh, would-be revolutionaries were plotting revolution, they met in the Apollo Room, the Raleigh Tavern, not far from where I was born and raised. There's pictures of me being pushed in a baby stroller on Duke of Gloucester Street in Colonial Williamsburg. But they, they all probably had somewhat different reasons for why they wanted to have a revolution against the king. But nonetheless, they all wanted it. And, but they did, they, you know, they were like Greeks. They got passionate. They told each other they were full of this and that. But they also had what the Greeks of old would call philia, 
a sense of communal love, a sense of shared duty, uh, risking their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honor. Uh, it, but it, and it takes a lot of guts, and you don't know how things are going to turn out. These are not scripted events. But you do it with the sense that if society is not going to have a shelf life, if open societies are not going to meet with the same faith that they did uh, with flourishing Florence and Athenian polis, uh, where collaboration and competition coalesced in ways that led to extraordinary accomplishments, art and governance and such, then we have to recognize the pernicious patterns that are repeating themselves in our own time and climate. And we have to look at ourselves as the change that we want to see. We can't point the fingers at politicians or anybody else. At the, at, or at the very least, we also have to ask ourselves, uh, what is our duty? Uh, succeed or fail? It's the heart, for me, it's a heartfelt attempt that matters the most. Let's, uh, so that's what I try to do, understanding through just cultivating th uh, thoughtfulness, sort of breaking down the kinds of walls. So I have a tattoo. That's my tattoo. And, and it's based on two of the teachings from my yaya uh, in Greek letters. I have dual U.S. Greek citizenship. I took the family full circle. After my first book was published in Greek, my publisher sponsored my citizenship application. My dad was teary-eyed because uh, it, he felt like this is what we need is sort of this coalescing of American Greek culture in one person, <laughs> his uh, very persevering son. So on the left-hand side, it says Meraki. You know, live a life filled with soul. You wake up in the morning, you give it everything you got. Soul and passion, even when you're meditating, whatever. But you do it fully. Fully embrace it. And the other one is arete. Arete is to live a life of all-around excellence in which you sort of uh, don't break down knowledge, disciplines, unless you also want to build them back up. Uh, that enhances our metaphorical thinking, our poetic thinking and doing, so that we live a rather musical, poetic type of life that leads to more love, empathy, and understanding. So here's how I met Mike. I went to a civic salon in Montpelier, Virginia, at the Center for the Constitution, and I sat at a table. I don't have a picture of him in the Porsche with um, the late Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, the late Supreme Court Justice, and with John Alger, who had just become president of James Madison University. I almost fainted when she said she read my book. I almost fainted. Uh, and she said that uh, the reason I wrote Constitution Cafe was because if they did a survey at the center. They asked this question, would you change the Constitution if you could? If you could? Most people ages 36 and up said they wouldn't. Most people ages 18 to 36 said they would. But here's what both groups had in common. They hadn't read it. <laughs> I mean, maybe they could recite the preamble because they had to do it in high school or something. They could even do it to a song or a jingle. But they hadn't read it yesterday or two years earlier or five years earlier. And so I thought, well, maybe this all, I, I went around and held offbeat constitutional conventions, asking people what they would change if they could, based on Thomas Jefferson's idea that we should have enough faith in ourselves to just build it from scratch every 19 years. Yeah. Have we done that? No. But so ultimately, it made me more appreciative of the feet of our framers. They created an extraordinary document uh, that a constitutional republic of a representative variety that ideally has the mechanisms in place that would allow us to have a flourishing, vibrant, open society over the long term if we all participate fully and freely. So that's a, and then from there, I met John Alger, who's now just the recent president of American University, but I met this wonderful man uh, who was really my host for that day. I gave some, I had some great class engagements, gave some stilted, awkward speech otherwise. Uh, sat, stood behind a podium, which is as anti-Chris Phillips as it gets. And this wonderful man, who was so beloved by his students, um, showed me a lot of, of what it can be to be a true educator, somebody who has humility, uh, who has extraordinary knowledge and passion and curiosity that um, makes such a difference in students' lives. And so now, here I am as an inaugural speaker, thanks to Mike Davis. So let's give it up for Mike. 
some, somebody I truly learned from. So my, I come from two straits. Uh, my mother was born and raised in a coal mining camp in Tams, West Virginia. Has anybody ever been to Tams or heard of Tams? You've been, you've been there. So I used to, this is Tams. It was a, they've torn everything down now, devastatingly to me. But it was a self-contained coal mining camp with a benevolent coal baron. And he and my great uncle Ira was a school principal. And he could recite prodigious passages of Shakespeare. But he was also this incredible Socratic inquirer and questioner. A little um, sardonic, uh, according to my mother. She says, she showed me a picture of him. We look so much alike. It, um, it's, it's breathtaking. But it had a, you know, it had a church uh, for blacks, a church for whites, had a library, had a canteen. But my mom was born there. And I used to go and sit on a dell and just wonder what it was like to live in a place where there's sorts of walls, you know, where she couldn't really see the world beyond that. But thankfully, this benevolent coal baron had a very packed library, and she read voraciously. And eventually, she, she left uh, members of her family and uh, moved to Newport News, Virginia. She um, quit practicing the religious faith that they had of Jehovah's Witnesses. And she embarked uh, admirably on a, on a very different life and studied to become a nurse in Newport News, Virginia. So that's, um, that's one kind of wall that she somehow managed to transcend, I think, largely through reading, which gave her the imaginative, moral imagination and existential imagination to um, create a life of her own. And, and then the uh, next slide is my, oh, this is my mother and them at, at Tams at the coal mining camp. She was the uh, oldest daughter, and that's my mamaw. So I had a mamaw and a yaya. It was really cool. I don't think anybody else had a mamma and a, and a yaya. I never had a grandma or grandmother. I had a mamma and a yaya. It was awesome. All right, next one. And so here's my other strain, Nisiros, Greece. And the church, is, the Orthodox church is actually carved into the mountain. It's just gorgeous. You ha it's, it takes a, it's a long trip to get there. You have to fly to Athens and take another plane to an island and then take a boat. A long way, but that's where my family is from. It's um, surrounded 360 by the Aegean, and I sort of feel close to the immensity there. To my father, who passed away under very tragic circumstances, I feel him there in a way I've never felt him anywhere else that I've ever been. So I try to go back there as often as I can. But there's a real culture uh, of a, and the same, honestly. Among the people I've encountered in West Virginia, Renaissance thinkers, very understated. They don't wear it on their sleeves pretentiously. But um, some of the most thoughtful people I've ever met in my life are in West Virginia and on this island of Green. Uh, many of them, you know, relatives of, of my mother and of my father. So it's been a real blessing for me to have such distinct cultures that I think have meeting points in terms of inquisitiveness, curiosity, and a, you know, a desire to make something of one's life. Okay, next slide. But here's the thing. You know, how many of you have had uh, knock down, drag out arguments of late on political issues? Tell me about it. Tell me about it. Yeah, but tell me a little bit more. Come on. Yeah, so it's, uh, you know, mostly just like healthcare things, you know. Like what? Uh, especially when it comes to like the IVF treatment, especially. Um, both parties take very strong stances. Um, so it's, it's very easy to get uh, passionate about what you're arguing about and kind of lose sight of uh, uh, the love that we should really have for one another. Why is it so easy to lose sight of that? Uh, Honestly, I'd say a little bit of selfishness, um, uh -huh. just to say that you were right and yeah. someone else was wrong, really, just to kind of put yourself up a little more. Have you ever changed anyone's mind on the issue? <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I really haven't. So what's the point then? Exactly. Yeah. Well, yeah. what is it? Is it okay to just have at it, hammer and tongs, and just not change your mind, but just to get it out there? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, to speak your mind is one thing for sure, and I think that everybody has a right to do so, for mm -hmm. sure. But there is a, there is definitely a correct way to do it, and there's a harmful way to do it. What's the correct way? Uh, honestly, not to infringe on someone else's uh, uh, feelings and emotions. Mm. Try not to, because at some point you're going to try to penetrate right. the other's emotions. Mm -hmm. That's that's the way that you're going to change their mind because they're going to be emotional right. about what they're about what they're. Uh, ideas are yeah. so talk about walls sometimes you you tra you traverse the wall and you invade their space in a way that makes them not happy exactly yeah, yeah. So sometimes walls are maybe not so bad you know yeah. they have feel like you know this is my space and this is my belief system and let's res respect that somewhat mm -hmm. yeah okay thank you who else has been in one i saw some other hands grow up I thought I saw you raise your hand. Yeah, that's good. It's like, oh no, Chris is going to pick on me. I have probably a debate in my life like almost every day. I just can't stop. But with who? Almost anybody. <laughs> you know? I mean, do you, do you put a sign, seat to all, to all comers? Or like, how does it work? I think maybe I'm just very opinionated. Yeah, but and how very does it, wrong a lot of the time. I know, but how does that um, spring into a, a dialogue or a debate? Like, do y'all do you, do you intentionally say something to see if it'll get a response from someone else, or maybe how's that I happen? just have very firm beliefs, and if anybody wants to ask me about them, I'm more than willing. So okay. I don't know. All right, like on what? What are you talking about? Oh God, name a topic. <laughs> Ab abortion. I'd say, yeah, I have an opinion. Have you talked about it, though? Yeah. Not in this environment, Not in but this yes. With, <laughs> I have a very uh, strict Catholic friend. Okay. So understandably, the topic comes up yeah. sometimes, and we have very different religious beliefs. Okay. So. How about gun, uh, Second Amendment? I have an opinion. What's your opinion? I'd say I'm um, somewhat casually pro-gun. Okay. Although I wouldn't say it's a fanatical opinion of mine. Uh -huh. Okay. Great. But so, have you ever changed someone's mind? I think so. Like on what? Let me think. It's going to take a while. And I'm not, I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, I think the question I'm asking is, does it matter whether you do or you don't? Is it okay to just... Have I, think it? it's, yeah. I think it's fine that I don't always change somebody's mind or nobody changes my right. mind. Uh, maybe I just, uh, I like to use conversations like that as a way to, uh, I guess, test my own beliefs. Well, learn I think that's from, actually noble. Learn you, how to express myself, and uh -huh. I think it helps other people. I don't try to be outwardly combative mm. with the conversations that I have, but I just try to get to reach their understanding. Mm -hmm. and hope that they can see mine as well. Well, that's awesome. I, I really applaud that. He's Thank taught you. me things, and I'm his professor. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Say that again. He's taught me things, uh, and I'm his professor. Well, let's give it up. And that takes humility, you know, to say that. That's beautiful. It's absolutely. Oh, well, tell me. I get interesting perspectives right. from him on a, a number of things that are, are very worthwhile talking about. Uh -huh. So it never devolves into a more shouty? Certainly not from my perspective. Not from your um, perspective. And, and maybe that's because he and I both, I feel, have the desire to gain perspective uh -huh. rather than to impose our viewpoint. See, how do you, how do you know what somebody's agenda is? Do you just sort of, um, like I've gone into classes today, and I think most of them could tell my only agenda was to engage in, in discourse, that I wasn't trying to lead them to any version of truth with a capital T. But it always is thrilling to me that people will, who don't know me from Adam will just suddenly start engaging with me. 
But um, so that's that's really wonderful that you can do that. Part of it is he knows about some things that I don't yeah. know much of anything about, too. That's wonderful. Of course, you could probably say that about nearly anybody, couldn't you? You could, but yet circumstances seem to be such that this kind of healthy give and take doesn't happen as much as at least I would like to see. That's great. Who else has had uh, some interesting political exchanges of late? Have you? No? Oh, come on. <laughs> Let's get down here. Come on. I'll, I'm going to quote that. I'm going to remember that. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I speak with Paul, I speak about politics with my friends almost every day or every other day. Argue about politics with my brother, but I engage mm -hmm. in respectful conversation with every, nearly everybody else I speak with. Mm -hmm. So give me an example of something you all might have added about. My brother and I? Yeah. Oh, well, I don't want to put him on the spot, but he's not here. Oh, is he here? Yeah, no, he's not here. His ears burning. <laughs> we used to argue before he got educated about the issue about the Russo-Ukraine war. Believe it or not, um, I wouldn't call him a Russian apologist, but he wasn't very educated about the subject, about the topic. Why? What makes you say that? Because that can tick people off if they're ever told you're that's not very educated. That's okay. So. He he would go out of his way to make up reasons as to why. Mm -hmm. Ukraine brought the war onto, onto themselves. I mean, it's being recorded, so he has to release a statement later that I'm just a big old liar. Mm -hmm. But <laughs> Well, don't worry. I'll share it on my YouTube channel. <laughs> <laughs> no, he yeah. would just... Now, is that me. the only person that you sort of... Um, I, I speak passionately about politics with my friends, but usually it's just very cordial, you know, keep the same attitude that we're here to learn about each other's perspectives on different topics and uh -huh. we respect oftentimes we uh, disagree more than we do agree uh -huh. which is I think is good for political discourse uh -huh. is it does discourse a civil discourse always have to mean speaking in modulated tones and or can you sort of get passionate um, it depends on I would say it depends on who you're speaking with and it depends what you're talking about that, that's interesting. It depends on who you're speaking with and, and what it is that you're talking about. Interesting. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Anybody else have any? I mean, do you think that, yes, over here, in the cheap seats. That's a, that's a joke. Thank you. Um, me and my two friends, so we live together in the same uh, dorm, and we don't, I'm not going to say like there's one specific issue where we're like, oh my gosh, we completely disagree, but like yeah. we'll have political conversations and we, we might disagree at the start, but then by communicating, we figure out where each yeah. other's ideas align yeah. and we realize, you know, okay, we might have a different approach or a different perspective, but we kind of want the same thing. So it just mm -hmm. allows you to think. Um, differently in that aspect. So it's like while there's maybe not one uh, specific issue that we're like, oh, this is, we have strong opinions, but it's like mm -hmm. we bounce off of each other and try mm -hmm. to gain each other's perspective because we mm -hmm. know that we have varying perspectives on mm -hmm. certain things just based on our life experiences. So. Wonderful. You guys are my role models. I'm, I'm so, let's clap for all of you who've shared. That's really amazing. I, uh, I think some of the biggest culprits of division are people more my age, skewing my age. I've seen, um, I've had some intensive travels these last two weeks. I do this Constitution Cafe uh, activity every Constitution Day. And the dialogue itself went fine until somebody said something about COVID. And he thought more people were dying from the vaccine than um, those who were, you know, than lives were saved. And all of a sudden, it became, this was after the formal exchanges, it became incendiary. And there was, I said, well, they clearly uh, weren't even really listening to each other at that point. But there were, it was triggered, and that was that. Uh, the same thing happened when I went to my alma mater, the College of William & Mary, about how to overcome political polarization. And somebody made a comment about the governor that the, another person took umbrage to. And they forgot about the 300 rest of us. And they just clashed. They forgot about me. They forgot about that there was a moderator or anything else. And I finally had to get them to stop and say, 
what do you, what's, what's the goal here? You know, what are you up to? And um, I didn't solve anything. I think it shows, uh, it, it, but I do think that young people, young people are the ones that are going to show us the way. And I'm not just talking about college students. I've seen more thoughtfulness from elementary, middle, and high school and college, the students themselves that have set an example for me whenever I tend to go too far in another direction. Obviously, there's exceptions to every rule. You know, um, I know a lot of people say young people are too impressionable, this and that, but I have found them uh, more often than not to be my role model in engaging in thoughtful inquiry. So that's why it's such a blessing for me to come to college campuses. Because for me, Mike, how much time do I have? Just, okay. So let me, let me just stop here then. For me, the issues aren't between pro-Second Amendment and sensible gun control measures. It's not between pro-abortion or anti. It's between being able to love someone, even if you find their viewpoint rather repugnant. You know, can you still love that person? Because I've had friends from high school from 47 years ago who I've noticed have suddenly unfriended one another. Been friends for almost half a century. And I said, well, what's happened? Said, well, we uh, dis disagreed vehemently over abortion, and I just couldn't tolerate it. We disagreed over Trump, couldn't tolerate it. It's happened three times in the last, I don't know, six or seven months. And I only have, I don't have that many Facebook friends to begin with, so I notice these things. These are people who have almost a half a century of shared history who quit speaking over a presidential, a president or a presidential candidate, over a, over a single issue. And it's like, can't you still love each other in spite of that? Can't you disagree passionately and still love each other? So that's... For me, the bridge that we need to cross more than ever is, is from hate, hating an opinion to not letting that make you hate the person. Maybe even loving the person more than ever. Uh, it's, these are not easy things to do. They're not easy things to do when you find a viewpoint so reprehensible, but they're necessary things to do. Now, of course, there's no absolutes in these things. Some people do cross lines. You have every right to find something so abhorrent, uh, whether it's something somebody says something outrageous about children or about immigrant groups or whatever it happens to be. Um, you have lines to draw, but maybe we're drawing them too quickly and for the wrong reasons. And so, if I if if I can get any point across now, it's you know test your own limits. Use dialogue as an opportunity to challenge yourself to be more patient, to be a more careful listener. Um, but you don't have to go, you know, there's times when you do have to take a stand when somebody says something that you find so abhorrent. But maybe it's not, maybe we're too quick to jump at somebody else and too quick to unfriend somebody and we forget the investment that we have in one another in our shared history, but in the shared history of America itself. You know, go to the Apollo Room in the Raleigh Tavern and think of our founders and how deeply they disagreed and yet came together universally to plot revolution and risk their lives, fortunes, and sacred honors. And maybe what we need to do more than ever today is to stand up for one another and our right to disagree uh, at times quite, quite vehemently and that that can actually be an act of love. So thank you so much, everybody. So I think you've given us a lot to think about, you know, and I know you've spent the day with uh, some of our students and some of our faculty and staff. Um, so I want to start sort of with a meta question about, you know, the, one of the goals of this series is not to just have somebody come in and give a lecture. I think you were a great example of that. Um, but to demonstrate what talking to others, what listening to others looks like. How do we teach that? I, don't, I think we have, we can model it. Um, I mean, there actually are some classroom uh, modules on listening you know, to how to learn how to listen better. It's not all the rage, but if you do a Google search, you'll actually see that within some course syllabi now, there are modules on how can I learn to listen better, what are my triggers 
Uh, how can I you know, learn to sit back and, and really keep my ears open and attend to what they have to say with all our being? These are, these are learned things. Mm -hmm. So we can take our worst habits and uh, if we care enough about modeling for what we hope for society at large, uh, we can practice things that are really difficult. I don't know if you've ever, did you ever do like peer review papers? Oh yeah. Yeah, it's always yeah. so easy to skewer other people, right. <laughs> show them where they went wrong. But to turn the tables, you know, what? I've never said a racist thing. What? No, no, I'm as open-minded as they come. What are you talking about? Oh no, this is, per suddenly when the tables are turned, it's much more challenging. And so, I think that the best inquiries are ones in which people serve as kind of gentle mirrors into our own souls, and that we learn on our own uh, more about our fall, foibles and flaws and blind spots. But again, these are habits that uh, have to be cultivated regularly. So that's why Socrates Cafe isn't a one-time show. Right. It's uh, once a week, once a month, wherever, whatever's convenient to everybody. And maybe the same people don't come, but it's got to be... Uh, the habits of, of getting together, maybe in many different kinds of settings, uh, more formal institutional ones and very informal ones at the same time. Sometimes you invite people from the community, sometimes it's just your classroom community or campus staff. Um, a number of our universities that I visit, I'll, I'll do an inaugural thing and then yeah. they'll have a they'll commit to a monthly Socrates yeah. Cafe and a campus center and the professors, staff, and students all take turns facilitating, and it tends to enrich relationships. That's great. I like the fact that you said habit, right? Because I think that's a big habit. part of it, right? Part of the reason you're good at this now is because you've been doing it for 25, 30 years, right? I'm sure you, when you started out, you had to figure it all out, right? I'm I still about, figured. Yeah, right, <laughs> and, you're, and you'll be better five years from now than you right. are today. Yeah, it, these are, um, I, I think I learned more from the handful of failures than I have from the ones that operate on all pistons. Yeah. But the, the idea is that it's, it's as much as I did say that I started also to become a better person myself and to try to be a little bit of the change is that um, habits like this can be cultivated. We have to maybe have a sense of history right. and a sense that, well, uh, the first Western democracy, the Athenian polis, that people began to silo themselves. Yeah. So what do you do if you know that little tidbit? You unsilo yourself really quickly and you get some other fellow Americans unsilo themselves too. And you may be awkward, you may not have any idea quite what you're doing, but you know you want to unsilo yourself. And we talked a little bit about this earlier is that lack of understanding of history is really interesting, right? People will say, we've never had a moment like we're having right now in American history in terms of the division. Right? People Look say at stuff the like Jefferson that Adams presidential campaign. It was vicious. It was absolutely, I mean, they went at one another, demonizing deliberately one another. Uh, what's, what's happening right now in comparison is uh, arguably pretty mild right. compared to that. Yeah. It, it actually can sort of tamp down your anxiety a little bit, knowing that these patterns have occurred before, but what shouldn't um, happen is that you feel a sense of complacency. You should feel more motivated than ever to get in that public square. And by public square, I mean, it could be here. You know, we're engaging with one another uh, face to face. It doesn't always have to be uh, everybody's invited. It can just be a, a group here and there. Uh, but I, I think colleges, university uh, communities are our great hope for salvation right now. I truly think that with all my it. heart, and I'm 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 thrilled. I, I I can already envision Fairmont University being at the vortex of this. I truly. appreciate that. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it's um, true. You know, I often I often say you know the good conversations often start with good questions, right? And in in your your book, uh, Six Questions of Socrates, right? You talk about the idea of virtue, right? The debate about where Socrates says what is virtue, and then they don't answer the question, right? And what you say is actually the the value is not in answering the question. The value is asking the question and then what happens after that. So can you talk mm -hmm. a little bit about that value of, uh -huh. of questioning and how we interrogate questions? You know, to me, I think one of the reasons I like doing this after 28 years is the unexpected. 
So I ask, what is virtue? And somebody says, there's no such thing as virtue anymore. We've quit practicing the virtues. Uh, that, uh, typically, the, the people who say that are older people who right. skew my age. And what's the problem? Who's not practicing the virtues? Can you guess? Young people. They're not practicing the virtues and values, according to them. And so, you know, you, and then what do you do? Well, you bring in some young people and engage as, as equals. You know, communicate on equal pathways for a while. Is it right in every setting? Of course not. Um, but sometimes to engage in an egalitarian way uh, can transform the way that we look at each other, consider one another. I mean, I've been, I've been doing a lot of dialogues lately that are intergenerational. It's magic. Um, when, when people with maybe multiple PhDs engage with a kid who's, who's in eighth grade and right. they forget all about that, the shield of degrees and pedigrees, they cloak themselves, and they just begin talking about, should the voting age be age 18? Or should we lower it, raise it? And they're suddenly, um, they're just fellow human beings, perplexed with their very strong points of view, but willing to listen to what others have to say. It's interesting sometimes to see how often People come in with one perspective if the setting is right, and they do change their perspective, uh, not just because it's a situation where they don't feel like they have to. They don't. But also because they just hear a thoughtful other person, who, and they consider it in a way that actually makes it feel like a safe place to alter or amend one's point of view. I've got a lot more questions, but I'll ask you one more, and then we'll let the okay. audience, we may come back to some of mine, but I'll ask you more. So, how do you have these debates and discussions with people who refuse to abide by any sort of rules of engagement? Because I think that's the yeah. hard part, is I think there are people who genuinely want to engage, and then when they do, sometimes the political climate is so fraught with peril that they don't want to if they, risk that. Yeah, how, how do you? Is there a way? I'm asking you, that's why <laughs> I, I brought you, you here. You like that, you see that? <laughs> this is called the, the Chris Socratic Phillips method. turning the table <laughs> method. <laughs> No, I don't think you can. Yeah. I think or on those things you think are non-negotiable. I mean, it's, it's the, well, those two I, things. I mean, I've been, I've had a number it's, of dialogues where they will not even meet me halfway. Mm -hmm. They've come as griefers, as derailers. That's why they've come. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do? All I can do is um, it keeps all the th other thoughtful souls from participating. And I actually have had to read the riot act. And, mm -hmm. and here's the problem. I've had, um, in Madison, Wisconsin, we had a group for 15 years. And then some guy uh, came deliberately to push buttons and to destroy the group. And he, the thoughtful souls quit coming. You know, he found out they started meeting somewhere else, and he, and he went there mm -hmm. and did the same thing. In a situation like that, I mean, wouldn't it be an amazing world if that didn't happen, but it does. And the group has to mean enough to you that if there's uh, an outlier who's just that determined to undermine a thoughtful inquiry, as much as we want to include that person, they're not ready. Right. Um, I've had, a, I'll say things, and I don't mean it in a glib way, why don't you start your own group? Because you obviously don't like it. Start the Greg <laughs> Show. You know, right. begin the Greg conversation, whatever. Yeah. And they w sometimes actually take me up on it and dissipates just like this. But um, if people aren't willing to at least adhere to a certain element of protocol, then um, what's that say? They're, they're, if they really want sort of to have a, a, a monologue that swirls around them. Mm -hmm. And that's not what this is all about. Would that it was for everybody. But it's, it's not. I mean, some people just come with, a, with malintent. I've had it happen on my online dialogues. Um, I told one class about one horrific thing that happened when somebody bombarded our online dialogue with kids, and I had to just shut it down. Uh, it, was, it was that horrific and, and pretty traumatic. So I had to suddenly create a, you know, uh, an obstacle where they had, I had, to, they had to write to me, so I sent them the passcode. Uh, to, to know exactly who it was or was participating. But if, if they're, they have to be willing to meet you 
maybe not halfway, but it's at least part of the way. Because right. otherwise, the group disappears. It dissipates. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, let's open it up to others to ask some questions. Like I said, I've got more if we need them, okay. but we'll open it up and see if the audience has some questions. Okay. We've got two folks around with microphones. I had a dialogue once, I'm sorry. sorry. It was in San Bruno, California. It was a senior center, and the question was, why don't young people practice our values? That was the question. And they totally forgot that I was there. And they, they started screaming at each other, telling each other they're full of SH. And it was like, I finally said, you know, thanks for inviting me. Got to go. So these, it, luckily, it's like one in a thousand. But it does happen. And when it does, what's the point of staying? It's, it's not going to work. It's not going to happen that particular time. You can come back, try again. Maybe they just had a bad day. There's all kinds of reasons that somebody might not be willing to engage. Maybe they're really insecure, you know, but I can't take the time, unfortunately, to psychologize about it because the, everybody else has left and they're not going to come back. Sometimes you have to chalk it up to you. It's more about them than it is about you. It's well, more about their we relationship with the world. Somebody right. else. Quite often it's because... As, as much bluff and bluster as we portray as facade, we're not as sure about our views as we would like others to think. Right. But not, even as understanding and empathetic as I am about that, it still derails the dialogue. It's, it's a problem. Yeah. If you have such conflicting ideas that there doesn't seem to be a way to thoughtfully have any mm. sort of discussion, what is something to always keep in mind that will, you know, kind of almost tell the other person that there is room for thoughtfulness? Well, that in and of itself, if you can have conflicting ideas and just be thoughtful in, in sharing them. I mean, the, the problem occurs when you feel that you need to alter that person's point of view, at least right away. <laughs> um, I found that people are much more amenable to altering or even overhauling their point of view if they don't, if they sense that they, there's no obligation to do so. But again, you have to understand that the gatherings of the kind that I hold are on a regular basis. So somebody, um, you can probably almost predict what somebody's going to say sometimes before it comes out of their mouth because you've gotten together with them so many times. And then something surprising happens. They, they do change their mind or offer a different perspective that you hadn't been expecting. But I, again, these are ongoing gatherings. And I think that uh, if there's any attempt over the short term uh, to, to try to, all, to have, you know, you have conflicting views. That in and of itself isn't a bad thing. Um, so you have conflicting views. So what? where the in interesting time comes is if you feel the need to change that person's view. And sometimes you justifiably have a great need to want to change that person's view. It may be a view that you just find abhorrent. But um, I think that you got to be willing to get together with folks who don't see eye to eye with you on a regular basis, that they know that you're not going anywhere, they're not going anywhere. And, and the mere fact that you engage with one another, if you can manage to do so, in an impassioned and thoughtful way, even if you are more entrenched in your own view week after week than ever, uh, that to me is, is success and victory. Chris, there's a theory in uh, uh, persuasion called irritation of doubt. And it's the idea that if you have a strong held belief and we have an argument or a debate about it, you're not going to change your opinion in that first conversation. But you'll leave and you'll think about it, or you might do some more research. Well, that's and, then very you come, and then you come back and you say, Well, did you think about this? And then we have that conversation again. So they describe it sort of like it gets worn down, right? Like erosion happens, and then you're open to ideas, right? Most of us don't have, if we have a long seated belief, we don't change it overnight. It takes years. Well, here's the other thing, and this is one of the reasons why it's so important to get together on a regular basis. Things happen in, in the interim in people's lives. You know, they might have a very humbling event that's happened that makes them look at something quite different. And I, I would rather not give specific examples, but things transpire in the interim in the spaces between one dialogue and another that suddenly might make it more conducive for you or the other person or both 
to be willing to hear one another out in a way you never would have before. Uh, some, and again, our, our, we have groups now that have been gathering for 28 years, and there's been some unlikely sort of odd couple friendships that have been forged as a result of it. But I, I think that uh, sometimes life experience itself will suddenly lend so itself to somebody, including me, that you thought uh, had an, was intransigent, would never change their view, suddenly they're more open to it. That's why it's important to get together and uh, create that habit of getting together on a, on a regular basis. Because things happen in our lives that might make us a little more empathetic, a little more humble. Uh, might be tomorrow, might be 10 years from now. But that's why uh, just having the place and space to get together and having some protocol, some guidelines, so that nobody steps beyond certain points and we feel that we're being invaded or attacked is, is very important. I wanted to follow up on that protocol statement. Um, I was a policy debater. I'm looking over at Samantha. I coach debate. I've worked in, with debate across the curriculum to try to teach educators how to use debate in the classroom. And a lot of those conversations begin with how do you engage in discourse with a person where you're expressing ideas that you might not necessarily hold to be true in your life. So sometimes it's easy to start with a person who's just out of the gate learning this by saying, you know, uh, let's have a debate about cats versus dogs or M&Ms versus Skittles so that there's no like, there's no skin in the game there, no one has an opinion or sometimes you'll role play so you take an opinion that's not yours. Um, so how do you I, how do you account for or in these groups you know you mentioned protocol like ground rules or teaching people like how to even come together to talk in the first place because I feel like we've lost that in some ways. Yeah, I mean these are it's really difficult. There, there's just no panacea to any of this, and um, some groups that never had to have a protocol suddenly did because one obstreperous person just suddenly started to participate, was, saw himself as the devil's advocate, pushing people's buttons. They didn't want to kick him out, but it changed the whole tone and tenor of everything. That, that happens especially with public groups. They might be going really fine for years, and suddenly one person can show up and... and derail things that create, may, suddenly makes it possible for the organizers to create a protocol that had not been necessary beforehand. Um, I mean, I, I think, I would think everybody, most everybody has their limits on certain things. I've had, I remember once when I was on Whidbey Island, Florida, some guy came out with a, a stance about uh, children and what should be allowed with children that I found so obscenely outrageous, I, I, I drew a line personally. Uh, I would rather not go farther than that. But um, I think I'm far more open than I was, but I still have my limits on certain things. You know, my wife, Ceci, is, is Mexican, so when certain ridiculously stereotypical things are said about Mexicans, that tends to push a button with me. And, and I, I become more aware of, of my own sort of failings in those areas. But isn't it okay to be painfully human <laughs> and say that's, that's enough? Um, but you know, I, I think most of the groups over the longer haul have had to establish some sort of criteria, even read them out as reminders like a preamble at the beginning because uh, Again, these are typically, not always, you know, even if it's in a, in a college, you know, new people typically come, some of the, some of the regulars come, and uh, some people just don't know how to behave. Mm -hmm. You know, their, their models are what they see on TV. What model is that? Or what they read on Twitter. And some of it, for, for, for you, for me, for others, is self-preservation too, right? If you're gonna engage in this work on a regular basis, you can't always just take hit after hit after hit. Some of it's self-preservation. You can't. You can't. I mean, I'm, I'm not a potted plant. Right. You know, I'm a, I'm a human being, and I started it also to maybe test what my own limits were. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with having limits, but you might 
you know, they might sort of shift over time. Uh, and, and sometimes it might depend on what kind of day you've had. You know, what has happened to you on any particular day, and maybe you're less open on that particular day. Which is, again, I think that what matters most is to get back in there and um, maybe to give people second and third and fourth and tenth chances. And at some point, maybe you just have to read the riot act and say, this isn't for you. Uh, I wish it was, but you have just refused in any way to engage us thoughtfully. You're just here to uh, push people's buttons. Because that, that is, we can psychologize about the reasons why, but it leads to the uh, dissipation of the group. Um, if they can ever come back and, and be at least somewhat civil, somewhat thoughtful, then welcome back anytime. But if these, are, these are difficult things. Dialogue can be messy. There's no real paint by numbers. I do believe that um, I love places that, uh, like a college campus, that offers a multiplicity of yeah. approaches. Plurality is good in most cases. And, and Socrates Cafe is, you know, there's no one size fits all. What surprised me after 28 years is how many groups we have. And now they are everywhere across the world. And it never would have even occurred to me. And in settings, that would never have occurred to me. It's really opened up opportunities for women and, and youth, and, and Saudi Arabia in particular. They, uh, now, some of the women have been absolutely ostracized by their families for taking part. They're really brave. Uh, most of the groups are facilitated by women. It, again, this is a society where there's no such thing as voting. Mm -hmm. There's no school board. There's no anything. They're all appointed. And yet there's a breath of fresh air where this is being permitted. And once the window of inquiry is open, watch out, baby. <laughs> it's going gonna, it's gonna to transform things. They might have innocuous uh, reasons, but people wanna, want more rights and more autonomy. It's empowering. That's great. Yeah. Uh, I've been thinking about how to word this question for the last like five minutes. So if there's any clarification needed, please ask me. Could you clarify that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but every student I've ever talked to would rather talk with somebody than be talked at. So when it comes to the education system, when there is right and wrong answers sometimes, how can we encourage this dialogue amongst students and among teachers and professors when there is a right answer? But, you know, I still think it's important for students to share their opinion because that's how you can become mm -hmm. educated. Well, you know, one way outside of the classroom is to have a Socrates Cafe type gathering where you can discuss that very thing and make sure that there's profs and staff members there so you're all talking as equal human beings, you know? And, they, and some might take that back into the classroom and be more thoughtful as a result. Um, I was at, I don't know how, if I pronounced it correctly, Quinnipiac? Yep, that's correct, yeah. yeah. And I was there the first week of the semester. And an 18-year-old who just matriculated said, I'm afraid to ask questions. She said, when I was in second grade, I asked a teacher a question. She gave me an answer, and I led to follow-up questions, led to follow-up. And she finally got upset with me and basically told me to shut up. And she had to move on. She said, I've been traumatized ever since that experience in second grade. She says, I'm afraid to ask my professors questions. You know, they ask a question, well, what are they looking for? What, what's, what's the answer that they're looking for? Is this a genuine question, or is he just trying to see what, you know, what I'm... So that's, those are, that's a very good question. And I think that's why it's important at times to have the kinds of round table or circle groups that necessarily include some profs and some staff members and a really open-minded, hearted president that um, can, can enable you to, to address these things because it'll impact and influence the rest of your life. Um, yes, we all have our areas of knowledge, but, and there's time. It's wonderful to create places and spaces where students can show their stuff. You know, they have areas of knowledge. I see some amazing professors who tell me that they learn from their students. Uh, there's so many professors uh, who wouldn't say that. It's, it's a beautiful thing because the whole idea for me is not to be a lifelong educator but a lifelong learner and to create 
even as I impart my areas of knowledge, if you t I took a, 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 like I developed a class at Christopher Newport University in Socratic Inquiry, because that's my specialty. Um, but the whole idea is also to have these moments that enable students to show their stuff or other people to shine as well. Because we all have our, our expertises in different things. That's one of the things that I do uh, when I'm giving at these Centers for Teaching workshops is help them develop uh, the art of framing questions in ways that have them and the students at times leaning in as fellow inquisitive human beings within their specialty area. It's actually possible to do, uh, but it's something that we're quite often not used to doing. In a, in a classroom for teach. So what I, what I do is actually a, a, a question exercise where I'll first say, I'm, well, I should be charging you for this because I usually get paid for it. I'm, I'm kidding. Um, I think we're paying you. <laughs> yeah, but this is, this is. Okay, so first I'll say something like, um, ask a question to others that you th know that you know the answer to in your specialty area. Let's say it's your academic specialty. You know, ask a question that you, that you know the answer to and you're asking it because you want to share the answer to, okay? Now here's a more challenging one. Ask a question in your specialty area that you feel like you don't know the answer to and that you think the students might be able to help you with. Now, seven out of 10 will rise to the occasion and three out of ten will say, Dr. Phillips, I, I just don't have a question I think they could ever help me with. I just don't. But seven out of ten will come up with something. It's really cool. And they'll say, okay, well, ask a question outside of your professional specialty. It's not a hobby or something that you think you know the answer to, but you can ask the question because you think they don't and you want to share your answer. And I'll say, okay. Now ask a question in your hobby area that you don't know something about that you'd like to learn from others. And so then it's easier to come up with something, you know, because in a hobby you usually have some areas that you're not so expert about and you really want to learn something from others. And then suddenly, you know, you kind of see everybody who's taking part in this practice with me kind of leaning in, you know, because everybody's students are so beautiful. They want to help. So if there's, they're asked a question in a way that uh, an educator really is seeking their help or insights, they're just like, it's such a beautiful thing to watch as they really strive to help come up with some sort of insight. Um, but these are, again, they're, they're, they're practices. Uh, to me, what's important is to emerge um, with a sense of humility and a sense of beautiful perplexity and curiosity. Uh, where we all have our different knowledge areas. You ha absolutely have knowledge areas that I could benefit from if we, if we had opportunities to engage one another on a regular basis. But it's, it's a process, and then it, there's this exercise to do on, on framing questions artfully, framing questions more artfully in ways that are much more conducive to having people lean in. These are, these are learned things that we can do, including me. Uh, on the art and science of, of art, of framing questions better, more effectively. So that's a good transition. I've got one last question for you. Um, so after this, we'll have a reception up at the third floor of the Falcon Center. Everybody's invited. There's free food and drink, so they can connect with you there. But if they want to connect with you after this event, how do they do that? Because I know you want to. You don't want this to be the end of the conversation. I don't. Be, yeah. um, I, I just have to tell you what an, uh, how grateful I am uh, to, to be part of this. It's uh, I. You can connect with me in many ways. Uh, you can go to our Instagram at the Socrates Cafe. At um, Twitter, I'm at at Christopher Cafe. The, we have a Socrates Cafe YouTube channel which is almost close to 1,000 subscribers now, and I'll, I'll upload some stuff from this very meaningful day I've had today. I had a few 
many dialogues with people today, and they willingly uh, let me record it. The, um, you also can find me on LinkedIn. Is you, do you all use LinkedIn at all? Yeah. So I'm, I'm on LinkedIn, and Mike is one of my, my LinkedIn buddies. On Facebook, if you go to Socrates Cafe, there's many, many, many Socrates Cafes, which is really cool. But then at mine says, I think, uh, uh, Facebook, like Socrates Cafe found, and you'll see me. I can't remember what the image is anymore. And from there, um, again, just message me. And, and my, if you go to our nonprofit website at um, democracycafe.org or socratescafe.com, my email's right off of that as well. But I, I would welcome continuing the conversation. I'm going to be doing the week after next a online Zoom on the question, how do we become an informed citizen? Mm. I think it's a vital question at this time, right before the election. And I'll post that on my various sites, and I would really welcome your participation in that. I'll hold it in, the, in an evening so that um, it's more likely that people can take part. But yeah. Well, thank you very much, Chris. I, as I expected, you're a perfect kickoff to what we're trying to do with the speaker series, right? You're getting that conversation started. I think that's really important. And I'm, hopefully you come back and visit us often. Oh, yeah. um, you know, we've already... got a little gift for you on, on your way out. You know, we'll give you some Fairmont State swag. Nobody goes away without some maroon. So uh, we'll send you on your way. But I hope you come back often and hope everybody joins us at the reception afterwards to have more to continue the conversation. I so. do. Thank you so much. Thank you, Chris.